Hello Bloomers, welcome to Better Future Podcast. You're about to listen to a conversation with Phoebe Tickle. Phoebe is a scientist, system designer, social entrepreneur, and co-founder of a series of organizations dedicated to systems change, with the latest one being Moral Imaginations, an organization with the goal of bringing about an ecological society of the future using imagination-powered change. The aim of this podcast is to highlight people imagining, inspiring, and building a better future. So I had a great time discussing many things related to solarpunk, the need for it, and also some evergreen topics, sometimes causing rifts within the community, uh, like the growth, the role of technology, revolutionary and utopian versus reformist and protopian thinking, uh, etc. We also discussed the overall power of imagination, experiential imaginative approaches based on systems thinking, and much more. Uh, With that said, enjoy the conversation. I learned about you first from uh, basically the Foresight as you're a Foresight fellow, but also on Twitter. And I saw that uh, you know your uh, tag there is Solar Punk Girl. So I thought it would be uh, great to actually start this podcast with uh, some questions about Solar Punk. But since asking a Solar Punk Girl about Solar Punk makes sense. Uh, so maybe if you can uh, like begin with the introduction, maybe for people who don't know or would like to hear your opinion or what a Solar Punk actually is, uh, like how do you how do you go about describing it? Mm-hmm. Great. Let's start with solar punk. So solar punk, in my view, is an answer to um, the dystopian kind of visions of the future. It's a very hopeful, it, it paints a hopeful and uh, positive, but not, um, but but also realistic vision of the future. And o- often it kind of depicts um, communities of people who are struggling towards a, a more utopian vision of the future, but, but haven't uh, got there yet. Um, you can think about it as a kind of aesthetic, artistic, fashion, architectural, literary, literary um, and general cultural movement. And it's about envisioning and imagining a new world um, with a better future where problems like big problems like climate change and racism and war have been either solved or are in the process of being solved. Um, and the reason I love it so much is because it brings together um kind of visions of the future that have like equitable, new, you know, new forms of democracy, like new human technologies combined with appropriate use of, of like high technology. So, you know, often it'll include visions of uh, robotics or, um, you know, decentralized infrastructure, you know, distributed ledger technology, like all sorts of different forms of technology, solar power, obviously, um, which, you know, lends its name to solar punk integrated with, um, as I say, the kind of human, like activism, democracy, social systems, um, and with conservation and protection of nature. And so for me, I I started my career as a scientist, as a biologist and working in biotechnology, um, specifically in algal and bacterial biofuels. And so it was like, you know, very technological. And I also loved, you know, spending time in nature and saw ecology and the protection and conservation of our natural systems is hugely important. And I had a massive interest in governance and how we do governance differently and how we create societies that that are fair and, and you know, are kind of omni-win as um, Daniel Schmachtenberger, who, who is a great um, friend and, and person who's featured on Foresight before he, he's got this phrase, I think, omni-win, like these omni-win systems. So that's that's solar punk um, for me in a nutshell. And I think the reason I notice now that it's like really starting to pick up steam, like for the last couple of years, it was very, I, nobody said, nobody even like commented on my Twitter handle. And if they did, they would say, you know, what what is that? Um, but in the last couple of years, a lot of, you know, I'm noticing more and more, it's like I'm being mentioned in tweets and I was interviewed by the BBC, um, like the UK's national newspaper about solar punk. So it's like, it really seems like a moment where this movement is starting to pick up speed, um, even in the cultural mainstream. And I'm, uh, I'm glad to see that finally, because I've been, it's been on my radar for quite a while, but, but then mm-hmm. it definitely seems like it's, it's picking up. Uh, the pace uh, recently and i have also written down that you said somewhere that the the goal of your activities uh, uh, is to reintegrate uh, reintegrate scientific ways of knowing and felt experiential imaginal sense of radical interdependence with nature which uh, kind of resonated with me a lot and i it's also i guess uh, 
the way or how I was drawn to Cyberpunk in the first place, you know, this combination of uh, nature and technology and, and humanity and kind of like the reconciliation of that. So that, mm-hmm. that, that's uh, definitely a good uh, like a point where people are drawn to, to it, I think. And how did you maybe, uh, that's actually a question that I was interested in, how did you find like Cyberpunk in the first place or how did you like, get involved mm-hmm. in it? You know, what was the origin story? Mm-hmm. I think... Um... I started, it was when I started my blog, uh, what year was that? A long time, seven years ago. So 2014, I I started, I like bought the domain, like my full name domain and started a blog. Um, and the tagline of the blog was humans, nature, technology. And I was writing about how can we kind of bring these three together to create this, you know, like triptych of a, a new society. <laughs> it's like... Yeah, when I reflect on, um, I feel like I've I've become maybe less utopian, but maybe, I don't know, it's like the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. So there's something about being young and when you're just like, yes, like the solution is these things. And then you're like, okay, the more I understand about all of these systems, the more I understand why they're stuck in kind of gridlock um, situations. But anyway, the, the blog was, yeah, Humans, Nature, Tech. And eventually I think somebody said to me, you know, have you heard of Solarpunk? Because that's basically like a name for what you're you know, bringing, these three themes that you're bringing together. Um, I just loved that. I loved it because I already really resonated with the um, the idea of punk, like the the gesture of that and and the kind of um, the text, the texture of it, like people kind of resisting the the system, but in this way that that also has style and aesthetic. Like it's not, you know, it's not like um, hippie. There's something quite different about the the punk energy versus the hippie energy. But then the the combination with solar and bringing together technology with the kind of alternative systems that that are more present in these like more fringe alternative or hippie projects. Like I thought that was so exciting because it was like, yeah, I I often think um, when we start thinking about solutions to the world's problems, we uh, fall into like tribes, like tribal systems. And I, I could really clearly see these two tribes, like one of them for me was epitomized by like Ray Kurzweil and like Singularity University, who was really inspiring to me when I was much younger. Like, oh yeah, you know, these tech tech systems can solve things and this focus on scale and shiny technology in Silicon Valley. And then on the other side of the polar spectrum, you have like Joanna Macy and the work that reconnects and California, like eco village movement and like anti-technology and like the only technology we need is like charcoal like you know compost systems and what's funny is I spent time like I spent quite a lot of time in California in my 20s like I, I I've taken a lot of trips and spent a lot of time out there I actually um even had started started a PhD out in um San Diego at the Scripps Institute um, of oceanography so I was really I had a lot of resonance with California and I one reason I loved it was like in the same day I could be like in the NASA campus or like you know visiting like a tech farm vertical hydroponics farm in San Francisco in the same day I could be like in the most grassroots activist led community housing project with like racial justice and social justice at the core. And, but, but I've always felt this tension, like why are these movements so separate, you know, like in a way everybody as who's part of these movements are trying to strive for better worlds. And actually the people, you know, who are focusing on the tech would also want racial justice. I think if they really thought about it and actually had, you know, and the education or the communities to talk about these topics and actually have education in, you know, what it's like to be a person of color in, you know, 21st century America, like they would also want racial justice as part of the the techno utopian movement, or at least some people would not, you know, not everyone. And the world is becoming more and more politically divisive and polarized, which I think is, is yeah, is really a problem. But that's why I think narratives like Solarpunk have the potential to draw people from these different political factions and create coherent and conciliant, like reconciliation um, of movements. That's a 
I'm like, great, because I this is definitely how I feel about it the same way. And I basically the same, I, I'm kind of have, have the same story in the sense that I started with like transhumanism and Ray Kurzweil and all of that. And then over time also realized that uh, you know, some of those visions are interesting and good. And at the same time, they are kind of like disconnected a lot of a lot of time from the like humanity and, and, and nature and all of that. So there's definitely mm -hmm. uh, some, some uh, narrative, I guess, that, that would connect that together is something I was searching for and found in Solarpunk as well. Uh, there's mm -hmm. a, another quote uh, in, from an article that you wrote uh, that was called New Deep Narratives, which is uh, exactly on this topic. Uh, it's also important to remember that our stories define us, but they shouldn't limit us. Uh, they only exist uh, as much as we believe in them. The new story I and many others envision is one that is deeply human, with nature at the forefront and technology by our side. It is up to us to work out how these three can interact and support each other in creating an integrated, uh, diverse and holistic future. So uh, there, again, you can see the great focus on interdependence and all of the you know, complex complexity that goes to it. Uh, but how would you maybe, how would you describe this, like the power of the cultural narrative? Uh, you know, what, what could you tell the listeners about uh, why you think narratives are so important for us humans and how do you like you yourself or your organization choose to work with narratives? Mm -hmm. mm, great question. Um, for some reason, as you were talking, this story came to mind, which is a true story. I don't have all the details in my mind, but the broad brush strokes of the story was that it, a group of people um, kind of applied to be part of a, I think of, of, a, of a project that would take them to Mars. Like it was a kind of come and be an astronaut and train and you can come and you know spend time in Mars, uh, on Mars or like on the, I don't know, like in out of, outer space. Um, and they went through this like big training program and then they got in this space shuttle and it set off into space. But in reality, it didn't ever leave the earth. And they just put, they just created um, like on the windows, like they, they put like fake images of space or I can't, I can't remember the details. I'd have to look it up, but um yeah, and then and then when at, at a certain point they you know these the people came out out of the shuttle and they realized that they'd never actually gone to space and it was like a big stitch up and I feel like um, when you realize that you are swimming in a cultural narrative that was pre-programmed for you and that you have the power to step out, there's something a little bit akin to that experience of like you know somebody has constructed like an artificial reality bubble that you are in and you're like you know you're living your experience it, it impacts everything from you know the way you feel the things you eat the decisions you make like what you think is important and um it's, it's like the water that we're swimming in you know you can't see it but it influences everything um and so i think they're hugely important um as we've seen in like recent political campaigns and the you know the work of like Cambridge Analytica they can be massively weaponized and used to manipulate you know the human population at mass and at scale to to do and to think certain things and to do certain things and vote a certain way um, or not vote um, and and so just to also highlight there's this really interesting and deeply concerning intersection between tech platforms and algorithms and you know the use of big data and the ability to like analyze massive amounts of data about human behavior and then use that in in a kind of reverse way to then fine tune and you know almost exactly predict what you need to show a certain human being on their social media to get them to vote or to think a certain way or feel certain feelings which is like absolutely terrifying um and so that yeah we, we're swimming in these cultural narratives um and the work I'm really interested in and I'm focusing a lot on at the moment is how to create the conditions for people to reconnect with their own sense of what's important, like a, a, their own, in a sense, like weave their own cultural narrative of like, what kind of life is important to me? What kind of human being do I want to be? It's very like almost going back to the first principles of, of who you are and what kind of life you want. Um, and I see this as a necessary kind of immunization against narrative warfare and manipulation, because if you in, in yourself have a very strong sense of what's important and who you are and what your values are, I, I think that could that can prepare um, you and kind of protect you better against like external manipulation. So, um, yeah, that's my focus. And that's why I think it's important.
so sovereignty in a sense, like really human sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I guess the underlying threat under all of this usually, uh, well, is uh, technology, right? So uh, mm -hmm. in, in a lot of ways that there is, a, that's like one of the reasons why we kind of need to go back right now because uh, the technology is kind of too far. So we need to uh, try to catch up as well on like human side in a sense or, or uh, so in that, in that line of, of, I guess, my question is how you or like, yeah, how you, how do you define technology yourself? Because like in the solar bank community and also uh, in, in like the techno optimist, I guess, space, a lot of people are, you know, either seeing that the, uh, as it, it as like the thing that will solve everything and others are kind of revolting uh, against it in a sense so from my point of view you know technology can be a lot of things not just like high tech you know shiny gadgets but also uh, you know low tech or some indigenous like processes or something like that but but i guess uh, it really depends on how, how we frame like technology and what do you actually mean by it so so how do you uh, even if you like background uh, in science how what's your opinion on that or how do you see that hmm how do i define technology Um, I was quite influenced by Kevin Kelly when I was younger, who wrote uh, the book, What Technology Wants. Um, and he talks about a techne or like a technium, I think, um, just like this kind of consciousness of technology having its own will, because it's it's almost like this, yeah, emergent decentralized system that starts to exhibit like characteristics, like, it's a, like it has its own will. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with you that the, you know, technology can be can be used in a very broad way. I think earlier in the conversation I referred to social technology. Um, yeah, how, good question. How do you define technology? I think it's, uh, I mean, in its broadest sense, it's like any kind of innovation or novel kind of, um, it could be a, an approach, a tool, a, yeah, an, an innovation. But I think that's extremely broad. Um, but in, but, you know, if you get to that kind of, that level of broadness, then nature is also full of technology. And I think there's something fundamentally non-natural when we refer to technology, we're usually talking about things that are not nature. Um, but that boundary is very, you know, can be very blurred, especially when you start to get kind of nature technology interfaces or, you know, the ocean is full of microplastics like how do you even how do you get the technology out of the nature now that it's you know that it's completely infused um everywhere um and i don't know if you you know if you think about craft like you know ancient kind of as you say like indigenous practices and crafts and um also you know really really kind of high high tech innovations like you know some of the practices and uh very acute abilities to sense things and perceive in indigenous people that were you know honed over thousands of years you could say as an extremely high form of technology the same as like a precision nanobot in a sense but it's a yeah that's a very broad metaphorical um definition uh, it's interesting because uh, we're kind of getting a uh... In, in conflict with the own with the word itself right like technology means something and then trying to redefine that or like, like actually define it and using even terms like high tech it's just kind of recursive and then low tech for things that are actually kind of uh, high tech but in a different way than what usually mm -hmm. means yeah that's a that's a uh, weird okay so maybe a different way how to look at it is um or and maybe one more point that uh, i remember uh kevin kelly as well one one term that uh, inspired me a lot is uh, pertopia. I don't know if you've heard about that yeah. term, but basically, and that's also connected to solarpunk in a, in a way, I think, because mm -hmm. solarpunk is kind of a like utopian vision in a sense, and trying to try counter the narrative from uh, so cyberpunk, which is more like dystopian. And it's, I guess, oh, it's definitely good that there is a vision like that, some, some utopian. The, the, I don't know if it's a problem, but maybe like one concern I have with it is that utopias are sometimes like um i don't know if they inspire enough action and that's why i like the protopia i guess more because it's more focused on you know improving step by step every day and trying to get better at it and rather than just having you know some real well it's good to have some like long-term vision that like serves as, a, as an attractor that like brings you closer to it but on the other hand 
I guess that's a like philosophical view, but whether you know if there is a too lofty of a goal or too too uh, far away goal, whether it actually isn't in some sense like not detrimental, but but whether the steps uh, that you mm. can see are not that uh, uh, concrete, I guess. And that kind of touches on one of the questions or one of the struggles I see in the community uh, in the Salpan community as well. But, but and, and not just Salpan community, I guess it's overall in society. But this you know. Uh, struggle between or fight between like a uh, uh, reform versus revolution and i guess like with solar punk and and the punk name in that uh, part of the name it I, i would guess it tends more towards the towards the like uh, revolution part you know more that seems more punk in a sense mm -hmm. but on the other way as i'm coming from the i guess like tech background and actually trying to improve something you kind of learn that yeah a lot of things are stuck just because the, there's a lot of different moving pieces in, in the in the system and then you know overturning the system is uh, a lofty goal that i'm not that sure how how well we can do that and how fast we can do that and yeah. we actually need to do something fast so like what's your you know how, how do you uh, see that whole uh, discussion i guess mm. i find the idea of overthrowing the system really interesting because it implies that we are not the system it's like then what then what are we And you know where does the where does the system end and where do I begin? Like where is where how much am I colluding in the system when you know this laptop that I'm using to speak to you is made out of minerals that were mined in you know using modern day slavery and it's you know it's like it is impossible to take any one of us like out of like the system take the system out of any one of us currently. Um, so I think that's why we're so stuck because of this like radical entanglement that we have with the system. Um, like we are, we are the system. It's impossible to separate. Um, I like the idea of protopia a lot. Um, obviously I think it can be really useful to use like futures thinking and inspiring, you know, you can use an extreme. It's almost like a gradient. You use an extreme of how things could be better to kind of help pull the present towards that future, or at least so we hope. Um, but protopia is, I think one thing I like about the definition of a protopia is that it also integrates the things that are kind of negative, like it also integrates the problems of tomorrow. You know, like we might have things that are much better, but we might also have entirely new problems, um, which I think is also very important in terms of futures thinking when we're mapping out possible consequences or unintended consequences of the future, which then can help us uh, make better decisions in the present. Um, yeah, and I guess it's, there's something about like us moving toward, trying to evolve towards this like, um, this perfect, you know, it's like the, the perfect but unreachable. It's like the circle, was it Socrates or Aristotle where it's like there's this perfect sphere and it's like, that's like the utopia that we're like trying to come towards. but you know, we've never, it's never been, there's no such thing really. Like there's no such thing as a world without problems of some kind, which I think is sometimes actually left out of, some, of the conversations. It's like, maybe it's more about deciding which problems are more uh, livable, you know, which are the problems that we can live with, which is, I mean, it's not a very nice thing to say. It's like, obviously we, we want to eradicate, you know, all these problems, eradicate um, inequality and eradicate, um yeah like deadly diseases but like it's very unlikely that we ever eradicate everything um so being very realistic about what are the most dangerous problems to things like human freedom and uh equality and um well-being i think is yeah being real realistic appeals to me and i think having these like north stars of utopian visions can be very inspiring for people just even opening up the possibility space mentally and in 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 people's minds like oh that's possible i'd never thought of that you know amazing that you could think you know imagine a food system where all of agriculture was regenerative it was also regenerating the soil um so yeah that's that's what i think no oh, yeah yeah i personally with that because i i definitely see the necessity and the value for in, in the utopia and in, in, in the vision and on the other hand exactly uh, it would be great to integrate more of the like not i guess i don't know if 
realistic thinking, but more of like a on the ground, you know, Protopia, we know that there will be problems and, and we just need to try to s- solve each of them step by step, like at least improve them a bit by bit and, and therefore not get stuck in the, you know, kind of, in a sense, it can actually create like a sterile, sterile vision of the future if, if there are no problems, because that's sometimes yeah. the problem also with like solar punk and, you know, how people are always asking, like, how do you create conflict, you know, in the, in the, in the uh, right works that they, they want to try uh, to write. Uh, and if we eradicate all the problems, then uh, that's probably not, you, we need to create some artificial ones in, inside of mm-hmm. the, the future to actually have some conflict in them. But yeah, that's, that's interesting. And speaking of, uh, the, I guess, uh, cleanliness of narratives do you how do you do you think that solar punk narratives need to be like really clean or is it more about like because that's another like uh, i guess um rift that i see within the community that a lot of them are always or people are always discussing you know what is solar punk and what is not and, and whether this whole uh, thing like labeling and, and trying to be precise about what is solar punk actually or, uh, how do you how do you think about that I like the idea of like of plural plural futures within solar punk, like a larger umbrella and people with their different visions. I think, yeah, something any kind of movement that that defines a single vision that must be shared by everyone starts to feel a bit like a cult. Um, and at the same time, I think like a, any movement having kind of principles that everybody agrees on is important because I, I see that solar punk could very easily be co-opted by, you know, different ulterior motives and, and different um, movements. Like <clears throat> I could imagine very much like a, a corporate solar punk kind of movement, like lots of technology and, um, you know, that you see within the solar punk movement, you often see these aesthetics, like the, the images of high rise, like Singapore style buildings with, with kind of, you know, plants on them and like, that's it. So it's basically just like lots of technology, potentially still huge, you know, very large levels of inequality of capitalism, like a lot of these societal issues that are part of solar punk to, to change and shift them. Um, but, but it's kind of dressed up with like green and solar energy and, you know, but solar energy without like the decentralized, grid isn't isn't solar punk if you take the all of those principles into account so i think yeah enabling people to have different visions is really important but how do we create a coherence of what is solar punk what isn't in terms of some base and deeper principles would be the way i i would see it another topic that touching on this kind of uh how how inherent do you think that uh, like the degree of movement is is uh, uh, with solar punk? Because that's another, I guess, rift. Well, the the whole reason I'm asking these questions is because I'm kind of like uh, as I'm diving more into the solar punk community, I always see that those like a uh, ideological uh, rifts within the community. And in some sense, I guess that's how it is supposed to be, right? Because if we want for a future, we'll probably have disagreements about like what actually is that future and, and what's not. But one part that uh, also seems to be pretty important and quite often discussed is just this, uh, like the growth movement. And even though I, I kind of like, un- I definitely understand the motivation and, and like why people want to do that. On the other hand, if I really think about it, I don't th- know if that's like a bad messaging or if it is, you know, because we actually want to grow like uh, technologies that are regenerative. We we want to grow, you know, uh, the uh, living conditions for people that are not yet at, at the good living conditions. And so there, well, I, it seems that there we also need to grow like, like regenerative technologies for that, right? Mm-hmm. So for me, it more seems like uh, the growth in some sense, uh, where it makes sense, uh, where there is ex- ex- excess, and at the same time, try to grow the right technologies. So that's how, mm-hmm. how I would interpret it. But then other people also interpret it in a different way that, you know, it's more about like complete the growth and need to kind of uh, not like return to the trees again, but, but kind of complete, you know, the, the technology I, uh, I guess. So what, what are, what's your um, take on that? Mm. Yeah, my take is that there's something very attractive about degrowth as like an answer to everything. It's like, oh, we finally found the problem. The problem is growth. Like you hear that a lot in the kind of new economic movement and, you know, great, great thinkers like Jason Hickel or like others who are just like growth is the problem. Um, I mean, I and, and I my view is that 
infinite growth is the problem. Like as a biologist, as a complex system scientist, I always go back to not just how nature organize in, in, organizes in that kind of biomimicry sense, but also what are the, the dynamics of complex systems and living systems. And one of them is, you know, birth and death, like nothing lives forever, nothing. Everything is always changing. And so, you know, some things, some aspects of the system need to degrow. I, you know, they need to deaccelerate. They need to slow down. They even need to completely cease in operation. But other things do need to keep growing. Um, but I think creating these artificial conditions where certain things, corporations, organizations, operations just accelerate without stopping is against like the natural order of the universe. It's not how, you know, it's just not how living systems work. Um, so I think it's a, I think it's a balance. I think some things need to grow. I think, as you say, regenerative technologies could, you know, need to grow, re, you know, regenerative agriculture could grow. Um, but if it grew infinitely, I'm sure we would then discover, you know, problems within those systems as well, because it's like a kind of total domination, you know, of a, or, or you could use the metaphor of a monoculture versus a polyculture. Like in nature, you have, you always have multiple species, you know, resilience is found in different species and different ways of doing things and, you know, different systems finding their niches. Um, so I do think we need to see radical amounts of degrowth, but not, not like blanket, not like everything has to de go through degrowth. I think it's like, it's a mix. Oh, yeah, I, I totally agree with that because that, that's, I think, exactly well worded what how I was kind of finding my way, my way into thinking about that. It's about some kind of a, a balance, right? I and mean, we need to rebalance the, the the system in a way that that's much more regenerative rather than how it is now extracted. And I think you also touched on that. Basically, what you it, you also in a sense described, I guess, the the slow punk movement as a whole that there needs to be you know different. I, I, that's how it uh, will probably keep to keep being sustained and, and growing in a sense in, in a good way. That if there are it's not just like monoculture uh, and it, if it's monoculture and different niches, different people have different focuses. Uh, and I think uh, Jay Spring had uh, described it that, uh, as that, uh, like a, uh, the solar punk uh, talk here at Stova uh, as a like, mimetic engine for a better future that will always be in a state of flux, but with blurred lines and ambivalence being actually its strength and design. So I guess that's, mm -hmm. that's uh, the, mm -hmm. the, in the end we got there as well. I would say that just um, that I think as I listen to you speak, like my thinking has really evolved um, around like the importance of values, like values and principles over you know, certain technologies over others or certain systems over others. Like I could really think that a connection to values and to deeper, a deeper sense of what's important mm. is, is what is missing in a lot of, you know, our leaders and systems today. Um, so a solar punk that, you know, a mimetic engine is great, but like, what are the values at the core of that rather than just like memes and, you know, technologies and ideas. It's like, to me, the important part is actually that deeper, deeper value mm. aspect. So that those uh, memes actually carry the value that, that are actually uh, should be included in that. Yeah, that, that yeah. definitely makes sense. So, and I guess that's a good segue into a different part or the, the next part of the, of the podcast. Uh, so uh, you are you have started an organization called Moral Imaginations. And mm -hmm. from what I understood, you're kind of running workshops and companies encouraging people to dream and reimagine a better future or a better world. Um, and how do you, I guess, how, how, how do you imagine something aligned with Solar Punk Vision or with the values that you want to uh, further, I guess, uh, and what are the like, core principles or values that are trying to uh, mm -hmm. see it with that approach and the organization? Yeah, it's the perfect segue. So um, Moral Imaginations is about, it's all about connecting people to a sen their deepest moral sense, which is different for everyone. Um, but the, the workshops and the experiences and the programs that we create essentially use the power of the imagination and in particular, the collective imagination. So we create collective imagination experiences and exercises and approaches that allow people to get out of their normal kind of business as usual way of thinking and actually access a kind of more universal sense of what is important to them. Um, and so to give an example, we use collective imagination using um, the shifting of per perception or perspective 
to uh, a future generation human. So we create a really immersive environment where people really kind of let go of the current, you know, the current day and allow themselves to really deeply imagine that they are right now, you know, seven generations in the future and speaking on behalf of the seventh generation human, which in a kind of cosmological sense, you know, you can also give people the sense that they are able to do that um, because in a way, all future generation humans are either alive today or present in, you know, that they're all present within our bodies today. They're just not yet created so there's a kind of you know there's a bit of a mind uh shift that can happen there of like you know you do have a right to be able to give a voice to to that future generation human um and through this process people access a different perspective like not just a longer term perspective but also the perspective of you know what imagine being a, a you know, a human being alive in 200 years time, looking back on this time and hearing about the experiences of a human being alive in 2021. And so people are able to access a kind of compassion for themselves that they, they're not able to access just on their own, because they're actually feeling a compassion through a future generation human for themselves in 2021. And that gives them the perspective to think, what am I doing with my life? Like, what, what, what am I doing? Like, why did I make that decision? Or what's really important? So this question of what's really important is at the heart of all of the work that we do at Moral Imaginations. And so we're doing this with organizations to help instill a deeper connection to um, like a responsibility, a commitment to, um, to in a sense, like a, a bigger vision of what it means to be a human being, which is really at the heart of the solar punk movement as well. I think religion used to tap into that sense of the kind of, you know, some people call it the higher self or this sense of like, who, who could we be, you know, who, who do I want to be like taking an intentionality to that. Um, and I'm just fascinated by that capacity of human beings to make decisions for the good of the whole, you know, and you see examples of this when you hear, about you know people risking their lives to help refugees or to protect um, you know prisoners of war or you know that there are these we have as human beings the capacity to make decisions based on these deeper moral values of of who we want to be and what is really right even if we exist in like systems that you know have different political views or the latest fashions or these more superficial kind of um, settings that we find ourselves in. So that's essentially the work of moral imaginations is creating these containers and spaces where people can access that sense, a deeper sense of meaningfulness, of belonging, of purpose, and actually creating a community of people who reinf reinforce that in each other. Because, you know, I, I'd say for the last 10 years, I've been on like a big research mission. You know, I've worked in science and technology, in food systems, in governance, in organizational innovation, in funding, you know, and, and on the side, I've read a lot about all sorts of different solutions and, and, you know, all of the different kind of technologies or approaches or regenerative agriculture or beekeeping, whatever, like all of these different ways that we could be regenerating the earth. And I think again and again, um, I just found that basically like the trajectory that we're on is going to take, um, it's going to take many, many people making decision, decisions that currently seem really irrational to actually stop the trajectory that we're going on. Like, you know, you have an amazing career that is set out in front of you. Um, you know, you, you've gone to the best university and you could have this amazing career. And like what this current moment is asking of many people is to turn away from the kind of lifestyle or the career that their entire childhood and upbringing and adult development has actually prepared them to believe is the absolute most meaningful and important thing for them to do. And it's how they, they prove themselves or, it's how they, you know, receive validation that they're a good human being. And in a sense, we're all going to have to make irrational decisions based on a deeper sense of what's important. And some people would call this like, you know, a heart-based decision instead of a head-based decision. I don't actually think that it's like, you know, it has to be not a head-based decision, but it's, a, it's decisions based on something that's deeper than our single human individualistic 
heuristics. There's something about the the bigger, the greater whole, the the yeah. So and so people like Gandhi and you know activists like like that who have been incredibly inspiring who who show you know they they kind of give their lives to what is really important. And I'm not saying that we can all become Gandhi overnight, nor should we be. But I think there's like a degree of that moral imagination that all of us can access, and that's what we need. I love that you're developing these methods for this kind of like perspective shifting because uh, it's something that I believe is really powerful. And even from my own experience, I guess like reconnection to some like cosmic identity there's this uh, thing that you probably know about called overview effect that people mm-hmm. sometimes uh, uh, experience when they go out to the space and actually see the planet as a, like one a fragile uh, thing uh, floating mm-hmm. on the backdrop of uh, infinite space i guess and and there are ways how people can also experience i guess slider uh, not that uh, uh, Im- not important but not that uh, uh, not that uh, experience exactly, but some uh, slider versions mm-hmm. of that. Uh, and I think there's a, it's very uh, interesting that uh, trying to you know, figure out how, how uh, and what are the actually the, the specific uh, things that we can do for people to reconnect. That's, that's amazing. Do you have like a specific, I remember I watched, um, it was like a collaborative poem writing session or something like that. And then, mm-hmm. and that was, uh, that was uh, superb. And uh, the, the result was really like moving in a sense. So do, mm-hmm. what are the, some of the, uh, experiences or, or the processes that you are employing in, in that in that sense. Is it any is there anything that you know people can do at home? Is there like a meditation or something like that? Yeah. Yeah there's a meditation on YouTube actually if you type in symbiosis meditation and my name. I think actually if you just type symbiosis meditation you can find a recorded meditation that takes you through um a kind of evolutionary journey of realizing that you are, you know, it's the metaphor like you are made of star- stardust you are made of, you know, the atoms that were once part of dinosaurs. So you get this real cosmic and universal sense. And I think um, it also, (laughs) I think my, my love of science was a bit of a gateway for my spirituality. Like to me, science is the ultimate mystical um, experience, you know, learning about bacteria learning about uh you know the fact that our our mic that we're we're majority i think it's 60 percent bacteria cells compared to human cells i mean to me that's just like an absolutely mystical truth if you deeply ponder that and really kind of experiential experientially um realize what that means like you know the idea of an individual suddenly starts to melt away which is like a kind of truth that you find in um spiritual traditions like the buddhist tradition you know it's all about kind of not non-self um which is absolutely backed up by science so yes there's that meditation um and we're developed we're working to develop kind of public publicly accessible tools and um toolkits there's also the impossible train story which you can find on our website so moralimaginations.com there's a video of um a, a, tra- a story about a train which is a metaphor for the pandemic and it takes you through this imaginary world where you um are then asked questions of you know what do you do now that the train has stopped and the train is a metaphor for society for the economy for your personal life for the you know your patterns, habits, addictions, whatever it is. And this, the train stops because there's a um, fire in one of the carriages, which is a metaphor for the COVID pandemic. And then I won't ruin the story, but the, yeah, that's an, that's an imagination exercise that you can do at home or with friends or with a group of people. So One other thing that I wanted to ask regarding, or like from, from the moral imaginations, I read about a thing that you called the great unflattening. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, the the short uh, thing that I write, wrote about it, or like that I summarize it as, or uh, as you summarize it, it's like reducing complex reality to silos and boxes inherent to even Western languages. And the great unfolding is kind of uh, trying to do something about that. So could you explain uh, a bit about that? Yeah. So um, the great unflattening is a metaphor for the kind of rewilding of our imagination and our and our perception. Um, and it's really about the kind of linear like we we, our perceptions are shaped obviously by our experiences but also by you know our education system what we hear from our parents what we go through at work um and you know with with the scientific enlightenment with these with, with newtonian physics like there's a lot of reasons why we've come got to this place where um we think in very linear causal systems 
you know, this happens and this goes on to affect this. And we, you know, we don't really have an understanding or a, a grasp of how complex systems operate. In, in fact, it's very absent in the way we've built our society and in our systems. Um, and so the unflattening, I mean, it's, all, it's about many things as well. It's also about the fact that we're discouraged from bringing our emotions or our personalities into places like our work or into our, you know, into our lives, that there's this, this kind of boxed nature of being um, a member, a functioning member of society. And um, there are many rules of how you can and can't behave. Um, and but, but a big part of what that metaphor is about is this re-inhabiting of feeling and imagination and coming alive and kind of that's that unflattening that instead of being in this flat universe where everything is focused on quantifiable metrics and impact measurements and um, yeah, uh, categories, you know, it's like a very scientific quantitative uh, data-driven world. There's a kind of unflattening where emotions and um, again, this like moral imagination, a sense of what's important for me, that that's what the metaphor is about. It's about bringing, coming back to life, um, breathing life back into the systems that we've created that currently box us and also our perceptions are are boxed in a similar way. Again, I think that I uh, really uh, am happy that somebody is doing and I hope that it will go uh, far. Uh, maybe that's actually a good, uh, I guess, uh, connection with uh, another topic I wanted to explore. Uh, as you said, you know, bring something to life and there is this, uh, I guess, when I wanted to talk about existential hope, and it, it kind of feels like there's a lot of people who are kind of losing hope in life, and and existential mm -hmm. hope can actually bring that hope back again and bring some life uh, back to life again. So uh, that's a part of the Foresight Institute uh, track or one of the mm -hmm. one of the one of their uh, projects, I, I guess. So how did you uh, got in uh, you know, contact with that, or how did you uh, start with them, basically working on that uh, that same kind of thing? Mm. Yeah, I love uh, the concept of existential hope. I was introduced to it by uh, Lou and Alison at, at the Foresight Institute. And Alison has created the website existentialhope.com. Um, I think I must have uh, discovered it when the pandemic hit, because there were quite a lot of initiatives that had this very hopeful, uh, positive, optimistic um, tone and, and existential hope is also focused a lot on kind of narratives and imagination and I really think it also has a strong connection with the solar punk movement and so I've been an existential hope fellow um, for the last year it has been a great experience I, I really enjoy um, being part of the Foresight Institute community um, and I believe it was it it originated with Toby Ord or like some of the people at the one of, I can't remember the name of the department in Oxford, but I think maybe like the Humanity Institute or yeah, some, some maybe you know um, where it originates, but I believe it's a kind of reaction or a response to the existential dread, you know, this, the whole burgeoning field of academia and uh, research around like existential threats. And, you know, again, it's like very focused on the dystopian. So it's a, a little bit like the solar punk response to existential dread is ex existential hope like what if we could you know create systems that actually live that flourished and didn't self uh, annihilate that's a, yeah that's exactly the same way how i basically got into it i found the website because i was searching for things like that and then through that got connected to foresight which is uh, which was a great community that uh, i guess i enjoy in a sense the most that uh, it's kind of like a recharger for my batteries so if i i'm kind of uh, falling into that despair hole a bit uh, you know scrolling through, through social media and all of that and, and reading the news then you can actually get again uh, and connected and then talk to people who are more again uh, radiating this existential hope and it kind of recharges you which is uh, which is I, I think the community is great have you what are, right, maybe what are your highlights from the community or like what do you like about it the most? Um, I think probably my highlight was the the series of like 100 salons that Alison and Lou wrote <laughs> in the three month period or my, like six month period when the pandemic hit. I just thought it was so heroic. <laughs> such, such an impressive feat of community convening and uh, gathering and uh, I, I participated as a speaker in 
I think two, two or three, and also many of them as a as a participant. And I loved the, yeah, the the intersection of kind of existential hope and technology. And uh, I think one thing I really admire about foresight is they cultivate a a real culture of positive regard. Like there's a sense that anybody can ask a question. No answer, you know, no question is the wrong question. It's very open and focused on learning, and so. Very much appreciate that. One, then we can maybe switch to a different part of the podcast with more personal questions. And since we are talking a lot about the uh, you know, kind of optimistic or at least uh, existential hope uh, and, and that kind of mindset, do you do you have a recollection or can you trace back like how did your kind of optimistic or solutionistic uh, mindset uh, develop in the first place? Like you know, was it was it something that you think you were? Um, nurtured in uh, from the start like by your parents or was it more like later in the life or uh, because i'm always interested in how people actually got to uh, actually being some positive force in the world so how, how would that how did that work for you um i don't think my parents were like mega positive <laughs> about the future uh actually i think they they uh maybe it's exactly because they um would would speak more about kind of you know we we spoke a lot about things like politics and um yeah the way society is broken and more like the negatives actually um so i wonder how that that influenced me um maybe to think about well how do you how do you solve that because when you're a kid or when you're a teenager you're just like well every problem has a solution. So why, you know, why is there no solution? So I think that that probably did have an impact on me. Um, I think I cultivated a lot of my positive outlook in by spending a lot of time in nature. So I'm half Hungarian, half English. I grew up in London, but we would spend every summer holiday in a small town in in Hungary. And we'd we'd basically spend the whole day, <clears throat> my my sister and my friends and I would spend the whole day like in forests or by lakes or by rivers, you know, going camping, having adventures. I think I source a lot of um yeah, like a deep love of the world in in my yeah the time i've spent in nature and i think the other thing is practicing art so i did a lot of art when i was growing up um painting drawing when i was a bit older printing you know like creating prints and i think art is just i actually think art should be like the one compulsory subject for everyone because it's not a subject it's just a container for human expression and um you know the the great thing about art is like you can basically do whatever you want and it's it, you can't really be penalized if your art is not good because it's still art like it it just is it's it's a it's creativity so i think that's also you know having a creative force like being connected to one's creativity is part of it because life creativity is also kind of i'd say the the elemental kind of force of life you know of evolution and mutation and like evolutionary biology like life is always innovating it's always creative it's coming up with wacky uh ways of of creating solutions um well solution is the wrong word more like just new ways of doing things that then work <laughs> and many of them don't and you know we don't see those like ways surviving but also yeah anyway so <laughs> there's uh i think create the creativity and nature are the two places that that really nourished me growing up and do you remember any like a specific moments or um uh, you know sh- perspective shifts i guess that that you experienced or even like rational processes i don't know if, which one uh, more uh or like specific you know if you read a specific book or like manifesto or something like that an essay mm. that kind of like lighted the spark uh, i guess Yeah there were definitely like pivotal books I would I really I was influenced a lot by Philip Pullman's um Dark Materials which is very imaginative about um yeah like young a young girl and a young boy who kind of basically access like the keys to the universe in different ways like the boy has a knife that can kind of cut portals into reality and you know he can kind of travel between worlds like parallel universes and the girl has got this piece of technology this kind of ancient compass called an alethiometer which can kind of 
he, she uses to divine answers. It's like a divination, a little bit like the I Ching, which is like an ancient Chinese tool of divination. Um, and another book that had a big impact was uh, Awakening the Buddha Within. So I was very much influenced by Buddhism in my late teens, early 20s. Um, like discovering Buddhism was like discovering a manual to the human you know, technology system that, again, it was just like, wow, you know, this should be just like secular. It's not really a religion. It's just more like an operating manual for presence and awareness, which is like, you know, such a gift. It's like, kind of feels almost criminal that it's not taught at schools like meditation. I mean, now it is, but also mindfulness is taught, but not the whole Buddhist uh, practice. Um and I remember like really, really basic, simple, pivotal moments, like with my friends, especially I had a, a very close, I still have very close friends since I was the age of 10. And we would take the bus home together after school and talk about, you know, life and the meaning of life and what we want to do, as well as everything, you know, boys and troubles and challenges. But, you know, we would have these like moments where we'd realize things. I remember one in particular was that if you choose to do something that you love, that makes you happy, then if you fail, you'll still be happy. And if you do well, you'll also be happy. So it was like really basic things. But I remember that being a really big one. It was like, oh, I don't know what to do with my life, but if I choose something that makes me happy, then it, whether I succeed or fail, I will at least be happy. So that <laughs> that was like, had a very big impact on me. Um, That's a great realization. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's very it's very basic isn't it yeah. i mean i don't think it really factors in the full spectrum of like you know having enough money to be to also you know be happy but i think it was a, a very good i'm glad that i had that realization because i think without it i could have chosen you know a different life path um I also think the near-death experiences i've had have had a, a very big impact on me and i had two um, under the age of 18. So I don't know if that's, maybe that's normal. I don't actually know how many near-death experiences the average human tends to have. <laughs> that's a good question. I don't think I had like personally a lot of them, but yeah, I can definitely understand uh, from like near, near, uh, I guess, family uh, death experiences mm -hmm. that, that it definitely changes something in, in yourself. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, definitely like a pivotal or a moving point, at least. I guess uh, yeah. touching on that sense, as you, as you said, you know, do something that you love and then, then further you have much more, uh, I guess it will be resilient to failures and, and keep moving forward and being happy still. Uh, that one uh, book and, and person that kind of inspired me uh, was Peter Diamandis and he wrote about this like massive transformative purpose, which is a, a good, I guess, uh, kind of worded something similar, like something that you want to do and that you uh, are able to you know always get motivated by do, do you have something like that formulated for yourself or is it more that uh, you're finding in and, and you know maybe moral, moral imaginations is kind of a, a output of, of that thinking but uh, mm -hmm. do you have something like uh, that you formulated for yourself in a sense or not could you repeat what is the thing by peter diamandis what's the it's called a massive transformative purpose so some kind right. of like formulation of like what's you know, the purpose that you strive to change in the world and and i guess that's moral imaginations in this, in this sense right Mm. Well, yeah, and currently, because I think I've got quite a, diff a few different ones, but this is the one that I'm currently really focusing on. Um, no, I don't think I do have anything really consciously formulated. Um, yeah, I think I have like, ba like principles, again, at the core um, and things that, you know, I will not do. Um, I think that's important to have kind of lines around that. Although I think those also change as you understand more about you know, and you have different theories of change. And I respect people who, you know, decide to change the system from within. And I have also had periods of my life where I felt like that was the best way that I could contribute to, to systems change was actually having a job um, at a large institution or an organization that's mm -hmm. really within the mainstream um, system. As we are moving towards the end, I have a few, I guess, long-term oriented questions that uh, uh, I'd like to ask you. So, and I think we may, might have touched on a few of them already, but but let's uh, let's see. Uh, what do you think are the most important problems, maybe like external or internal, both that that uh, we are facing right now, and when humanity saves or solves somehow, uh, would be able to create a step change towards a better future? Gosh, mm, 
I think our food systems is it's just a huge one, like the pollution of our current food systems and the, the fact that, uh, that we're kind of, you know, redu- every year it's like reducing the number of harvests that our soil has left. So like soil depletion, destroying soil. Um, but I know that there are many people who, you know, who just are waiting for like lab grown meat to, to be created and, you know, hydroponics. And I guess there's an element of like preference in this. Like my preference is to, is to live in a world um, that has wilderness and has, you know, nature and um, natural, um, real complexity. Like when you look into a forest and you see all of this self-organizing complexity, like I, I really feel that we need that. We need, we need to live in such um, environments. There's some kind of mirroring that allows us to also resonate or kind of, um, yeah, self, what's the word, uh, self-regulate with these kind of systems. I don't know if we create entirely artificial, an entirely artificial world, whether what it will be like, what it would be like to live in that and how it would affect um, human cognition, perception, happiness, well-being. Um, I think, um, what else? I mean, that I'm, I'm, only, I'm only like struggling because there's so many, not because I can't think of any. Um, it's hard to prioritize, I guess, the, the, the yeah. most important ones. Yeah. Yeah, but it's, I mean, it's a great, it's a good problem. I mean, it's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the the just like basic human needs being met for everybody, it's just mm-hmm. like a huge one. You know, the fact yeah. that there are people that die of starvation and or die of like basic diseases, it's like, that's just, I can't believe that that, that hasn't yet been solved. So everything from you know, kind of inequality to like, envir- you know, the countless number of environmental problems or like, the linear linearity of our systems but in a sense like there are all these problems and that's why I've kind of gone one one layer upstream and that's why I work at the level of kind of imagination and perception and working with with people in that realm because it feels like that's kind of one that's upstream of many of these symptoms that we that we see um, I'm curious, what, what what do you think? Well, uh, that's a good question uh, from the external point of view I guess that's a I guess that would be like a pretty basic uh, answer in a sense that uh, some, you know, really easy, cheap way how to generate a lot of energy and that would solve a lot of of different problems, I guess. But from the internal point, I think one of the parts is the something akin to existential hope that a lot of people are kind of feeling this despair uh, Mm -hmm. and trying to make uh, i guess containers or try to help people shift into different uh, different perspectives on, on that in that sense to, to be more hopeful that would be more not internal problems but maybe even more and i guess that's connected is that uh, i feel that a lot of people are like disconnected from their emotions so trying to get more people on board with their emotions first and try to experience you know more of their um i guess uh, as you call it uh, not for, flattened emotions but unflattened them a bit in a good in a good way and then i think that might help also with other things uh, down the line a lot of them so so i guess the uh, internal would be probably something connected with uh, our own emotions and and being mm-hmm. more in our bodies and then uh, external would be uh, getting a way how to you know solve a lot of problems with uh, cheap energy that would probably be the mm-hmm. be my answer to that uh, but okay, so if we take a little bit longer view, or if we consider some of those problems, uh, imagine uh, them, them solved, and imagine that you have like a possibility to live a longer, healthy life. Are there any like cosmic events that you would on like uh, large scale events or, or things that you would like to experience? You know, be it I don't know people traveling to the stars or uh, just connecting to people. You know, through some uh, some like really connecting through some uh, uh, not just. Uh, uh, like this, but maybe even like really deeply kind of mind melting together through some uh, interfaces or something like that. Do you have like a dream or something that, that you would like to experience? Such a good question. Um, I really don't want to mind meld with anyone. <laughs> I'm just like, my mind is complex enough. Um, yeah. Although I would be very curious I wonder, I'd be super curious. I would love to experience what it's like to be in the mind of somebody else. Like I just, 
if you could do the kind of Freaky Friday, you know, have a real embodied sense of like, what is it like to be in the shoes of someone else? Maybe that's why I'm so focused on moral imagination, because it's so much about <laughs> using the imagination to look through the eyes of other people. So it's interesting that that, that is what, you know, I'm really curious about. Um, I mean, I, I'm one of those people who I think before before I really came to grips with how negative the impact is of flying. Like I, I am someone who absolutely loves um, nature expeditions, like, so, you know, having a bucket list, like I want to travel to all, all sorts of weird parts of the world. I, when I was 17, I spent six, five weeks in the Amazon rainforest um, camping, like in the jungle as part of this ex scientific expedition, which is where I had my, uh, second near death experience. Um, but I think, yeah, I want to, so maybe it's like quite, quite humble in a sense. It's not like, Oh, I want to go to space. I've never really been very, uh, tantalized by the idea of going into space. Um, I think if the opportunity came around and it wasn't, um, yeah, if it, if it didn't like deposit a huge amount of pollution and energy to to do that i would be curious to to see the earth from outer space but that does that overview effect um just think it's extraordinary like i actually wonder like would you ever really be the same again after after doing that um but yeah i i still there are still so many parts of the world that i would like to to go into i want to also do things like um yeah, a friend of mine, Daniel Thorson, who runs the Emerge podcast, I just read on Twitter that he's going into a 60 day silent meditation. There's a part of me that I think is quite like a, an extremist that, that is like very attracted to that level of extreme uh, detox of, you know, technology and business as usual. So I think at some point I will also do more, um, like more, more things that are similar to that. Um, yeah, I'd also love to just experience a flotation tank, like a, you know, like a sensory deprivation tank. That would also be great. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I have a long bucket list. We could go on. Um, Those are pretty, you know, humble at least. Yeah. Uh, the, the floating tank, I, I tried it and it depends, I guess, for, for, for where, how good it actually is. But regarding mm -hmm. the silent meditations, I recently went to a seven day dark retreat so you yeah. are silent and in dark it's definitely something that's a kind mm. of extreme but in a sense it's a very uh, insightful you know you learn mm. about a lot about your mind and then you also realize how well, relatively quickly you can switch your brain to a different mode completely because if you don't have all the notifications and you don't have a sense of time for uh, seven days it's a, it's enough to actually get um, your brain into like a different mode that is much more again uh slow paced uh, much more yeah. in, enjoying uh, regular uh, small things so that's uh, it's definitely uh, yeah I, I would recommend i guess <laughs> in that sense mm, thank you. Uh, yeah. and uh, so coming uh, one maybe other question in the in this long term uh, future view uh, do you have a sense or how do you imagine uh, some the you know system changing or coming like what comes you know post capitalism or do you think it's like a UBI or something else or how do you see the transition going? Yeah, I think I think never trust anyone who has a coherent answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, yeah, I think the change it's just it's like there are so many different worlds like present right now. Like there are people right now already living in the world that we in the West will live in, you know, if, if we continue to go down the route of climate catastrophe, you know, there are people right now leaving their homes because of fires and, or flooding. Um, so it's like, it's, it's kind of a false perception to, to think that there's like any one system, even political system, even economic system, there are many. So like the way it changes will be like a multitude of, change i don't know i i think so it's very i can i can imagine this is seen as a cop-out answer mm -hmm. but um there's something about yeah being a complexity geek that stops me from answering that question um i also just don't yeah i just don't think i don't really think that's how reality works like that there's a 
a system and that it's going to change and then we'll be in another system. Um, I do, I do question how much we're going to kind of experience in the West, a sense of like a coherent experience of a collapse, like a disintegration of order and um, systems and running the way that we're used to them running um, and how much it's like, it's going, it's more subtle and gradual and non-linear and, difficult to predict and that yeah there's a kind of incoherent um breakdown i mean if things are to shift then the current you know current ways of doing things also need to stop and or change so we will definitely experience that in some regard um yeah i, d- I don't know i think yeah i think it's a good complex answer to a complex <laughs> problem and i i tend to agree with the uh, not they're not being probably like one big shift and it's more of a gradual process, I guess, with mm-hmm. not like linear, but uh, okay. So last three questions that are maybe a bit big, quicker one, but uh, if you uh, could bring one technology to fruition with a snap of your fingers, uh, what would it be? Hmm. Maybe cheap, clean energy for everyone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, uh, I'm on board with that. The second question is, if you imagine that we all have a neural link or something like that, that will enable you to basically share an idea or a concept or a mental model or something like that, what you want to share, experiential or, or thought or whatever, uh, with all the people in the world, uh, what would you share? Probably uh, an understanding of complex systems. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, probably really that. Um, yeah, or... Um, Mm, interesting. I mean, I don't know how how whether a Neuralink can transmit kind of feelings as well, because that would mm-hmm. obviously be. I don't. I have no idea how how it how this works. And if it could, um, I mean, God, it's kind of dystopian. It's like, oh yeah, everybody <laughs> should feel like liberated. Uh, like, mm-hmm. like a button. Also, don't think that's that's good. Um, it's like the human. Uh, yeah, I, I think like. Okay, so maybe a a bit less forceful uh, sharing would be uh, if you could share one question uh, uh, that people would be not not, like nudged to, I guess, uh, ponder deeply, uh, what would you ask them? I think a really basic one, like how could this be different? Hmm. How could this, this world be different? I think just even opening that possibility that things can be different is so powerful. The people they actually realize that the uh, change is possible mm-hmm. mm, yeah uh okay so the last question that i uh, tend to ask people and uh would like to hear your answer is um so if you could describe you know your vision of a better future in uh, as much detail as, as you as, as you want you know with uh, different uh, ideas approaches technologies whatever you want to be there and how it might look or not and basically how does your utopia or at least a uh, protopia that is uh, sufficiently developed in the future uh, how would that look and maybe what are the you know, most uh, overlooked or underappreciated things that that uh, the people listening right now might uh, uh, realize uh, might move us closer to a vision to your vision of a better future mm-hmm. i think i'll go with the protopia just something that i feel like is so kind of in our fingers fingertips like really within reach um, I would love to see a, a, a kind of return to a local, like a, a, a modern localism. <clears throat> and that sounds like really simple, but yeah, just basic community life in cities and in towns, especially in the West. Like, I think it's just so absolutely crazy, but also so inefficient that you have you know, groups of human beings that live in, you know, each other's vicinity and you'll have like an old person who has lots of wisdom and can take care of young children for free and then also, you know, battle their loneliness. And then you've got someone who can deliver food, you know, like there's, there's this sense of like, we have everything we need. And, and in, you know, part of what I believe has happened within kind of neoliberal capitalism is that we're convinced that, we can't meet our own needs and we're, you know, we're, we're isolated and alienated from each other, from community. We're even stripped of a sense of being able to meet our own needs, you know, kind of losing a sense of sovereignty. Um, so I really wish that we could meet our basic needs in community so that we could use 
the energy saved for like real innovation and play and art and like, you know, tackling like the big human challenges rather than the huge force of capitalism and innovation being spent and wasted on like apps that are about, you know, like ordering food from somebody who has to like produce food, you know, in like this kind of slave like way or like Amazon, you know, like there's something about the waste of human genius and innovation that is it's going towards meeting needs that we could meet with, you know, each other. Like we could meet those needs in very simple, um, efficient ways and we could actually be spending you know people talk a lot about like the value of capitalism being the being innovation and you know competitive edge and the fact that it kind of pushes human evolution to to create you know new innovations that wouldn't happen otherwise but I actually think that the the large majority of uh, energy resources and capital within this current system go towards um, meeting needs that we have artificially created um, so anyway, that's my, that would be like my protopia is just <clears throat> like regenerative agriculture, you know, done within communities, working together, sharing of, um, of, of resources of, you know, only having like reducing waste massively, having one lawnmower between 10, 10 neighbors, like that kind of, that kind of vision. I think that's a great uh, end to our conversation. So thank you very much for for talking with me and uh, where can people find you yeah you can find me on twitter i'm solarpunk underscore girl um and i'm also solarpunk underscore girl on instagram uh my website is phoebetickel.com and moral imaginations can be found on moralimaginations.com um and yeah those are the best places to find me awesome i'll put all the links in the description and then uh, thank you yeah, thank you very much and uh, thank you, see you next time a great conversation Thank you for listening to this conversation with Phoebe Dickel. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Find links to Moral Imagination's website and also Phoebe's personal site where you can find more about her. I recommend checking all of it out. I would also greatly appreciate if you could help to spread this message further by liking this video, sharing it with friends and subscribing for next episodes. And if you know about people that radiate positive and optimistic energy and are focused on solutions and building a better future, please mention them in the comments or in the linked Facebook group. I'll be glad to interview them next. I look forward to reading your comments and suggestions. And as the parting word, let me remind you that uh, it is in our hands to build a better future. So let's each do the best we can, step by step, because if we don't, it might not happen at all. All right, see you in the next one.